How are we all doing? Okay. Do we all want to slit? I'll stand up. Stretch. No, for real. Up. No, really. <laughs> up. Stretch. Power boat. <sighs> Stretch. Okay, sit. We can see mini break. We're good. Okay. Now we're super ready to science the crap out of DevOps, right? Yes. Okay. As she mentioned, I'm Nicole. I'm a chef. We make DevOps awesome. Um, I'm also the lead investigator on the state of DevOps report. Um, has, have we heard of this? Maybe? A little bit? Okay. So this is run with um, Gene Kim, Jez Humble. Uh, we do this with the Puppet team as well. So this is what I have learned from four years, sciencing the crap out of DevOps. Um, my background is in academia, so I, st I started doing um, some sysadmining. I used to do hardware. I used to like lay cable, super fun. And then I went and got a PhD because I like wanted to figure out how to make all of this stuff awesome. But I needed to know how to measure it in ways that were like legit and do it all the time because I used to measure log files and like measure it and capture it. But all of the data was messy all the time, and I had to measure it because I'd also I'd go to my bosses all the time and be like, "So this worked for this team." And my bosses were like, "Cool, that's not us, right? Who's ever heard that? That works for them. That's not going to work for us. That's not my team." So, or I would be like, "So the log file tells me that this works, right? Like our systems are fast, but I keep hearing from the people that our systems are slow, and they'd be like, people lie." People lie all the time. So I learned how to measure all this stuff. So this is what we're going to talk about today. How to make our data suck less, um, and sometimes through surveys. So how to write good survey questions, um, making sure the survey questions are good with science. And by the way, all of the methods that I'm going to talk about, like I'm going to talk about survey questions because the state of DevOps report loses, uses survey questions, because it's the only way I can collect thousands of data points from around the world in four to six weeks. But I've used all of these methods on log data as well. So all of these apply to all of your log data. Um, so what we found uh, that we did and didn't expect, um, and then things about continuous delivery, things about management, also things about culture, right? Because we talk about the culture as well. So by the way, not all data is created equal. I'll, I'll turn around for this one. That's fine. Who here thinks surveys are? <laughs> Okay, some hands, some hands. It's fine. You won't hurt my feelings. It's fine. I've, I lived through dissertation defenses. I've had people like yell things at me. I'll, I'll ask again. Who here thinks surveys are shit? Yeah, more hands. Okay. Who here loves data in your log files? More hands. Who here has seen crap data in your log files? All the hands. Y'all are my people. See, because. It happens, right? All the time. So either way, <laughs> yeah, so, so much love right here. Either way, like we have to find a way to get better data out of the data that we have, right? So here are some ways that we can do this. One way, can, one way we can do this is through what we call a latent construct. So I have like this cute little picture of a thermometer here. So, in surveys, we use a latent construct, but we do this because there are some things that we can't just like measure directly, right? So I can ask, or I can figure out, I can measure what the temperature in here is, right? I can ask someone what the temperature is. I can get one number. But if I want to ask what your culture is, I can't just ask you and like get a number. It's not going to work. I can't do that. I have to ask several different questions, and all of these questions have to capture different aspects and different facets Imagine like this super awesome Venn diagram, right? That like overlaps in a whole bunch of different ways. That's basically a latent construct. It captures several different facets of overlapping things. I measure lots of different things that overlap. When I combine those, I come up with one number. That's basically your culture temperature. I can do that also with like log data or, or something else, right? If I want to capture one idea of how a system's performing, I can come up with lots of different measures. And I do this because what happens if one, one number is bad, right? How many have seen crap data in your log files, right? If one number is bad and I don't know it and I'm only relying on one number, that, that's, that sucks. 
But if I'm capturing lots of different numbers and they all overlap, but one is weird, I can toss that out. I can test for it statistically. But all of the rest of the overlapping ones I can combine into one, and I can use that one number. So here we use psychometrics to make our survey data good or to give us a reasonable assurance that it's telling us what we think it's telling us. And again, we can apply this to our log data. So this is what I do. This is what I'm using when I do this data DevOps report. And by the way, this is why this is not just some like crazy marketing report. We still make it pretty, like give it colors and really big font and big prints. So you can read it on your phone. But that's why the findings in it are actually really pretty good. And, it, and it's why we use it. So by the way, when I started um, working on this report, I was, a, I was a tenure track professor. I collected this data so that I could get tenure off of it. So this is like, this is real research and it's, it's appeared in peer review. So psychometrics includes a couple of different steps when you're doing it uh, based on survey. The first step's manual. So construct creation, when, when possible, uh, like plagiarize, like the good side, right? So use measures that have already been used. If I can find a place that it's been used before, use that. Same thing with log data. If I know there are measures, methods, um, hooks into data that I know are good that other teams are using that have been validated, tested, used all over the place that other teams have like scrubbed, used, validated, use those. If not, um, I do it based on definitions and theory. Carefully worded, carefully crafted. Uh, I use a card sorting task, so like I take a whole bunch of things, write them on three by five cards, give them to everyone here, and I say, sort them into piles based on things that make sense, right? So do your own like little Venn diagram thing. Um, and then I pilot test it. Now, next step is to evaluate it with the stats version. So I establish validity, discriminant, and convergence. So discriminant means I have everyone take the survey. Based on the responses, discriminant means that it doesn't measure anything it's not supposed to measure. Convergent means that it only measures the things it's supposed to measure. Rule out the false positives, right? False negatives. Also establishes reliability. I can, I can test it statistically to make sure that everyone's reading it and interpreting it the same way. So this also means that for every construct, so construct, idea, uh, concept, I want to have at least three items, questions, usually f I try to do four, because that way if I write one, like I just screw up, right? Don't write it very well, I don't word it very well, I choose bad words, um, and one just doesn't load, loads the word. It just doesn't stick very well. Like I write it and I think it's amazing. Everyone else here is like, Nicole, you just screwed that up. Not good. The statistics will tell me and if I need to throw that out, I still have at least two or three left. So this is good for me. If I only use one question and I don't word it very well, and I think it's awesome and y'all think it sucks, I don't know. I don't know. But if I have three or four, and one of them is just no good, I can get rid of it and I still have these left. The other good thing about this is that when I have these three left and it's now a construct, I can average them together and I now have one solid idea. I can average them together and I've captured all facets. I have one idea. And now I have my temperature of culture. I have my organizational culture temperature. I have one number for this. So, as an example, what do I mean by culture? First of all, does it matter to our study? I'll do a literature review. We all say it matters, does it actually matter? Do I think it matters? Do you think it matters? Do we all think it matters? Uh, more than just intuition? Okay, but then what kind of culture? National identity and norms? So in the finance literature, they say that matters, but this isn't finance, although someday that would be pretty cool to look into. Are we talking about adaptive culture? Or are we talking about a culture that values learning? In the 2014 study, we included that. It turns out that matters. Um, do we look at a culture that values information flow and trust? We've used that for three years in a row, and it turns out that's super important. It predicts um, IT performance, which is how will we deliver code that's fast and reliable. That also predicts organizational performance, which is like money. So everyone loves that one. So we dug into that one. We use Westrom culture for that. Westrom's a super cool guy. So he's a sociologist. He studies healthcare, aviation, which everyone's like, tech. 
That's not healthcare, that's not aviation. Why are you using Westrom? We like Westrom because Westrom studies cultures that are high risk, complex, dynamic, and it's predictive of outcomes and it tells us what happens when things go wrong. Does this sound like tech? Sounds like tech. I am digging this one. So we were like, let's use it. A part of my dissertation said that these environments would be really applicable to tech. So we were down. We totally did this. So let's try writing this ourselves. So this, we found this from a paper he wrote in 2004. So when we write this, we want to use strong statements with clear language. So the trick here is that everyone calls them survey questions. They're not questions. Write them as a strong statement with clear language because you want people to answer on one being strongly disagree and seven being strongly agree. So here's how we did it. I decided to anchor on like the good thing, generative, right? So I anchored on seven and I wrote it as like on my team. So think about how we would do this. On my team, information is actively sought. On my team, failures or learning opportunities and messengers are not punished. On my team, responsibilities are shared. And, and can you think about reading through this and answering strongly agree, strongly disagree? So it needs to not be like kind of wishy-washy in the middle. It needs to be like definitely strong. On my team, cross-functional collaborations encouraged and rewarded. On my team, failure causes inquiry. On my team, new ideas are welcomed. So I did this on the three by five card first. Then I did a pilot test. And then we did it through, now at this point, this has been through over 20,000 responses. This has been found to be valid and reliable through all measures of validity, two different measures of reliability, and it's predictive of IT performance and organizational performance. So if anyone wants to use this, I now have, I've heard back from several teams who use this to measure, um, sometimes on a quarterly basis, at least twice a year, to check their teams. Because by the way, we know, that when cultures start breaking, technology starts falling apart three to six months following. So this is super, like six questions, super easy, super quick to check. The only thing to watch for is don't be like, so I want you to take this survey, your answers better be good. <laughs> don't do that, not gonna work, super not gonna work. Um, but, but this is handy. Now, so my nerd moment is Dr. Westrom emailed me and he was like, Dear Nicole, I hear you've been using my work. Can I see it? made it to peer review, but that doesn't mean like it matched what's in his head. He emailed me back a couple weeks later. He's like, this is really good. You've applied it quite intelligently. Yay. <laughs> okay. So here's another example. So here's what we did. So there's this thing where remember how I said there's like the card sorting task where I hand it to people on three by five cards, have them put it in piles. So there's the people version and then there's the stats version where I basically like throw it to the computer and the stats and I'm like, put it in piles. I thought it was gonna land in one pile. It didn't land in one pile. <laughs> land in a couple different piles. We used this in the 2014 study. Can anyone spot what happened? This was um, an example for notification of failure. These were the survey questions. It, it worked with like the dozen people that we did it with because we're like, yeah, this is notification of failure. This works. But when people, 2014, we had nine, over 9,000 responses. I want to say 9,288-ish, if I'm right. We were primarily notified of failures by reports from customers. We were primarily notified of failures by the NOC. We get failure alerts from uh, logging and monitoring systems. We monitor uh, system health based on threshold warnings. And we monitor health based on rate of change warnings. split into two different groups. Now, it doesn't tell me why. It's just like, you're wrong. Two. Now, what we noticed, though, is that there's notification from farther away, and there's notification from closer. Do you guys see that? Any guess which one is highly correlated with IT performance? The near one, right? And this makes sense, right? <laughs> we don't want to hear from Twitter that we're failing. 
not good. Super not good. So it, it loaded into two different groups, and then I run the analysis, and we find out that IT performance is highly correlated from, from cluster notification. Okay, and then, by the way, I do more data tests. So I make sure that like, because I happen to be collecting, in this case, I'm collecting all of the data from surveys, I make sure that there's no bias introduced because I only have one data collection method. Sometimes I also collect data from systems, and so then it's not a problem. I also compare early and late responders and make sure there's no noticeable difference there. Um, I also check for survey, any kind of survey drop-off rates and bias. Um, so by the way, I go through all of that before I even start checking for um, relationships among the data. Here I want to make one really, really quick note. So um, a note on analysis methods. You shouldn't be checking for prediction or like anyone says like cause causation or prediction unless you're meeting conditions. So like put your little skeptic hat on and most people are really great at this. Love you guys for this. Um, anytime you read a study that comes out and they're like, yeah, this super causes this. No, really? No. Um, people should only be reporting on correlations unless you meet some conditions. And here's why. Sometimes data is just this like crazy thing. Have you guys ever heard of the website um, Spurious Correlations? It's super fun. Do you know that number of pool deaths go up in the year that Nicolas Cage movies come out? <laughs> Who knew? Does one cause the other? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> so um, in our report, we do not, um, in our study, we do not report any prediction um, unless we have, unless one of these conditions is met. And here's what they are. The first one is longitudinal data. We do the study year over year, but we do not have matched data sets. So if anyone here, by the way, has anyone here done the study? Taken the survey? Love you, thanks. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes. By the way, take it next year, love you. Um, but you'll notice that we don't send out um, like a reminder email linking you to prior year analyses. I don't do matched data because people get like super scared about that. I'm not tracking you. Um, but because of that, I, I can't do a longitudinal data analysis. Number two, uh, randomized experimental design. This is not an experimental data set. It's just not. Um, three, theory-based design. Because I have some idea or reason to believe that A may be causing or predicting B, I will test for those. So unless um, I have a reason to believe that A may be causing B based on prior theory that exists in the literature, then we will only report correlations in the data and in the report. So anytime you read through our report or any other reports, if someone's just like, yeah, this crazy thing happens, in the, happens to appear in the data, you know, right? Spurious correlations. Okay, so here are some of the key findings. Here's one key finding in the data about IT performance and its behavior. So for us, um, IT performance is a combination of throughput and stability. Uh, this is how we define IT performance in our study. Throughput is a combination of the lead time for changes and release frequency. And stability is um, time to restore service and change fail rate. So the thing that's really, really interesting is over three years of data, over 20,000 data points across all of these teams, this moves together. So for years, I'm sure, has anyone here ever heard that like in order to get speed or in order to get stability, you have to kind of slow down on speed? Has anyone ever heard that? Yeah, I've got some hands. I don't see it not seeing it in the data. I do not see trade-offs. Don't see it in the high performers. I don't see it in the low performers. In the low performers, I'm seeing slow and I'm seeing like no stability. I don't really even see it in the medium performers very much. So if anyone's telling you, oh, well, if I need stability, we have to slow down, I don't see it anywhere in the data. Um, this has also um, appeared in peer review. Um, another key finding is that IT performance matters. For years, um, we've always heard that like IT doesn't matter. Also, that appeared in Harvard Business Review in 2003. Thanks, Nicholas Carr. Although, you know what? That was a very different time. That was when people thought you could just buy IT, plug it in, walk away. It didn't matter. IT is a cost center. Who's heard that too many times? Right? Ugh. That sucked. But you know what? It's because they were doing IT wrong. They weren't doing 
IT where it was technology and process and culture. If we do it all together and if we do it the right way, IT moves the needle and affects the bottom line. Firms with high performing IT organizations were twice as likely to exceed profitability, profit share, and um, market share and productivity goals. We also find that IT performance is predictive of organizational performance. And by the way, organizational performance is that profitability, productivity, and market share. And that has also appeared in peer review. So, yay, we all matter in a really big way. Give yourselves a hand. Yes. Yay, us. OK, so continuous delivery. So here's also what we found. Continuous delivery, again, so this is the technology piece, drives IT performance and org performance. It also decreases deploy pain. That's also awesome, right? We no longer have to have that panic when we release. What's important in continuous delivery? Comprehensive, fast, and, and reliable test and deployment automation, continuous integration, application code, system configuration, app configuration, all in version control. Have everything in version control, OK? But here's with added math. This is the peer review version. Um, we also found that CD decreases burnout. Um, what we added in 2016, because research is kind of iterative, right? We just need to add like small pieces at a time. You can't turn too many knobs. Um, effective test data management is also an important piece here. We also find uh, trunk-based development is important, which Jez loved, right? Because people keep asking, like, really? Do you need to do trunk-based development? We're like, listen, let's just let's just test it. He's like, really? Do we have to test it? Let's just test it. So yes, trunk-based development is an important piece. Also, shifting left on security. It does not slow things down if you do it the right way. What that means is including InfoSec in the design process, having pre-approved libraries, right? It doesn't have to slow things down. Um, the thing that's interesting here is that continuous delivery also helps contribute to less rework, right? Less unplanned work, still decreases deployment uh, pain. It also contributes to identifying strongly with the organization you work for. So I'll come back to this. Well, I'll just talk about it now. Why not? Um, who here does, I'm sure this makes sense, but now we have evidence for it. When you do super cool tech work, does that make you want to keep working for your company and keep doing amazing work? That makes sense. Of course we want to keep doing awesome, cool tech work and keep working for the company that we want to work for. And by the way, that also makes your company more money. It's basically like, it's a version of NPS, right? The Employee Net Presence Score. And that highly correlated with ENPS. We also captured ENPS in the study last year. So some surprises though, so in, on the tech side of some surprises, what is not, okay, audience participation time, what's not strongly correlated with IT performance? Where again, IT perf is that throughput and stability. Third party scripts, homegrown scripts, commercial CM tools, open source, golden images, and manual CM. What do we think? Red is not strongly correlated. Commercial CM tools, negatively correlated. Open source, super correlated. That one was interesting. OK, this question talks about things that load together. Think about, about that statistical card sorting task, OK? Which, which things measure effective test practices? So there are a few here that just didn't load. They just completely fell out. So this one, it didn't fall into different groups. There were a few that just didn't hang out together. Developers create and maintain acceptance tests. QA create and maintain acceptance tests. Um, primarily created and maintained by an outsourced party. When automated tests pass, I'm confident the software is releasable. Test failures are likely to indicate a real defect. It's easy for developers to fix acceptance tests. Developers share a common pool of test servers to reproduce failures. Developers create on-demand test environments, and developers use their own dev environments to reproduce failures. Which of these, oh, Sesame Street, which of these are not like the other? The ones that are different here are QA, primarily create and maintain acceptance tests, primarily created and maintained by an outsourced party, and developers create on-demand test environments. These are the ones that are different. 
Okay. Change management. Again, which one is different? So this one has a little R next to it, which means it's reverse coded. All production changes have to be approved, so are not approved by an external body. Read that opposite. Only high risk changes, such as database changes, require approval. We have no change approval process, and we rely on peer review to manage changes. Only high risk changes. That one's different. The one there that. Uh, so what does different mean was the question. It's different when, when people answered the survey questions. It falls out. It seems like it's different when people are reading all the survey questions. So it could be different. It could just be different because I wrote it. Like, Nicole, you're out to lunch. Or it just, it was conceptually too different. So this one could be different because I introduced a totally different concept. Suddenly I'm talking about database changes. The other ones don't talk about database. The other ones talk about very lightweight change process or no, no database, no process. Okay, we've been having way too much fun and we are like basically out of time, so I'm gonna fly. You ready? I'm gonna, I'm gonna like fly through and figure out only the fun stuff because they're waving me down in the back. Surprises with culture. Okay, I am gonna talk about this. So I said I was gonna talk about the identity items. These are the identity ones, where it's basically like, I wanna keep working here because it's super cool. Um, we also wanted to include the Google study. Have you guys heard about the Google study? So the Google study was like, we wanna study the people at Google to see what makes the perfect team. We think the perfect team is going to be the mix of the, just the right skills. Not what they found at all. They found that what makes the perfect team is team dynamics. So we turned this into survey questions. I'm not gonna tell you what they were, but it's basically like psychological safety, dependability, structure, and clarity. Do we sort of remember the Westrom items? The Westrom items are about um, team dynamics and like high trust risks. So do you know what's interesting? The, West, the Google items split in half. The first two items loaded with the Westrom items. The bottom three items loaded with identity. So if you read the 2016 report, we don't talk about the Google study because it's split in half. The top two items are basically really strongly about trust and information flow, taking risks. The bottom three items talk very, very much about identity with the work that you do. So, okay, management stuff. I will talk about this super quick. We all know that managing WIP's important. The correlation between WIP and IT perf wasn't really strong though at all. So what was happening? Turns out WIP shows up if you back it up and turn it into a piece of lean management. So that was one surprise that we had. And this is what we find out about lean management. Use of WIP limits, visual displays, and um, monitoring tools to make business decisions, not just wake yourself up in the middle of the night when the pager goes off, is predictive of IT performance lowering burnout and contributing to that organizational culture. And that feeds through into higher organizational performance. Okay, so conclusions. Even if you think it's obvious, test with data. If the results don't surprise you, you're doing it wrong. But if everything surprises you, you're doing it wrong. We can have it all, or at least throughput and stability. We don't have to have trade-offs. IT matters but you have to do it right. We have to have technology, we have to have process, and we have to have culture. DevOps culture and practices have a measurable impact on IT performance and on organizational performance, so it really does matter. So for more sciencing, um, you can go to devopsresearch.com um, and sign up for an ROI white paper that's coming in the next month or two and get peer-reviewed research. Uh, links to there, and thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.